The detective thinks he's investigating a murder or a missing girl, but truly he is investigating something else altogether, something he cannot grasp hold of directly. Satisfaction will be rare. Uncertainty will be your natural state. Much of your life will be spent in the dark woods, no path visible, with fear and loneliness your only companions. But answers exist. Solutions wait for you, trembling, pulling you to them, calling your name, even if you cannot hear. And when you are sure that you have been forgotten, and that every step has been wrong, and that the woods are swallowing you whole, remember this. I too was once in those woods, and I have emerged to give you, if not a map or a path, hopefully at least a few clues. Remember that I, if no one else, know you are there, and will never give up hope for you, not in this lifetime or the next. And the day I came out of the woods, I saw the sun as I had never seen it before, which is the only consolation I can offer as of now. I believe that someday, perhaps many lifetimes from now, all will be explained, and all mysteries will be solved. All knowledge will be free for the taking, including the biggest mystery of all, who we really are. But for now, each detective, alone in the woods, must take her clues and solve her mysteries for herself. Jacques Silette, Detection. Highbridge Company presents Claire DeWitt and the Bohemian Highway by Sarah Gran. Read for you by Carol Monda. Original material copyright 2013 by Sarah Gran. Recording copyright 2013 by Highbridge Company. And recorded by arrangement with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Chapter 1. San Francisco. I met Paul when a friend of my friend Tabitha played at the Hotel Utah late one Thursday night. About 20 people were there to see the Friends Friends band. One of the about 20 was Paul. I was at a table in the corner with Tabitha and her friend. Tabitha was tall and pole thin with orange hair and arms and legs covered with tattoos. Tabitha's friend was one of those guys who was too sweet to be real, or desirable. He was a little younger than me and smiled like he meant it. I saw Paul at the bar looking at me, and when he caught me looking, he looked away. It happened a few more times, enough times that I was sure it wasn't my imagination. Things like that happened to me often enough, and it was not exactly noteworthy for a man to make eyes at me across a dark and dirty bar in San Francisco except something about Paul, about his big dark eyes and his quick, shy smile, a smile he tried to hide, made me take note. At the end of the night, I felt his eyes on me when Tabitha and I left the bar, and I wondered why he hadn't talked to me, and I wondered if he'd planned that too, to make me think about him, because with men, you can never tell, at least I can't. Two weeks later, we went to the Hotel Utah again to see the same band, and Paul was there again. I wouldn't have admitted that that was why I went, but it was. Paul was friends with the guitar player. Tabitha's friend played drums. Paul and I avoided each other, although I didn't notice it at the time. He went over to sit with the band while they were hanging out drinking before the show, and I left to go to the bathroom. I came back, and Paul left to get a drink. I'd been thinking he was a kind of cute, kind of smart-looking guy, who maybe I would meet and maybe I would sleep with but that night I felt something in the pit of my stomach, more bats than butterflies. And right before I finally shook his hand, I felt a wave of dread come over me, like we were being pulled into a black undertow we couldn't fight our way out of, or didn't want to. Jacques Silette, the great detective, would have said we knew, that we knew what was coming and made the choice to pursue it. Calma, he said once, is not a sentence already printed. It is a series of words the author can arrange as she chooses. Love, murder, a broken heart. The professor in the drawing room with the candlestick. The detective in the bar with the gun. The guitar player backstage with the pick. 
Maybe it was true. Life was a series of words we'd been given to arrange as we pleased, only no one seemed to know how.